Okay. Hello, good evening. Um, my name is uh, Dr. Tara Ennis. I'm from the Department of History and Philosophy at the University of the West Indies Cape Hill campus. Um, I'm very pleased to chair this session, um, and I'll share a little bit more about that uh, a little bit later. But um, I just want to welcome all of you on behalf of the Barbados Museum and Historical Society and the University of the West Indies uh, Department of History and Philosophy. This is an annual lecture series that we collaborate on. Um, also to the National Cultural Foundation with support from another project that I'm involved in, and that is the Barbados Trailway Project. Um, I want to first in introduce our, um, uh, I'm not sure it would be a performance or a, 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 a poetry reading, um, but Linda M. Dean is a British-born Barbadian literary artist and activist. Uh, that seems to be the theme tonight. Also known as the Summer Storyteller, she is one of the Publishing and Cultural Forum Arts Etc. and co-editor with the Canadian writer and filmmaker Robert Edison Sanderford of Shouts from the Outfield, the Arts Etc. Cricket Art Anthology. Her poetry and essays have won two Frank Cullimore Literary Endowment Awards two Prime Minister's Awards, and a Governor General's Award of liter Literary Excellence. They appear in Caribbean and international publications such as BIM, Arts for the 21st Century, MOCO, Caribbean Arts and Letters, Give the Ball to the Poet, and the Cordite Poetry Review. Her first poetry collection, Cutting Road Blues, a narrative is currently in press. She is a creative writing instructor and mentor, operating in schools and communities with anyone who truly wishes to write. In addition to family, migration, and memory, other themes that interest Linda are race, identity, and hybridity. Her main sources of inspiration are jazz, the environment, and her children. I have very similar interests, that's, that's interesting. But in her dream, she would love to be a dancer. So I'd like to invite uh, Linda M. Dean to the podium to, to give us uh, her poetic um, inspiration. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Thank you very much, Tara, for that, and to the museum for this invitation to poets and writers to be a part of this wonderful migration lecture series. Um, I am happy to be here, and I'm really looking forward to hearing Professor Chamberlain's lecture after. Um, I'd like to share with you a few poems uh, that I've been working on. It's um, a collection that started even without my knowing. I've been interviewing my parents, my mum and my dad, um, on the sly. Right? So having conversations and taking notes and occasionally those notes that end up as poems. And I realized I was having conversations with my late grandfather and making notes. And this is going back 20 years and not even realizing why. But now as I start to write, um, it's becoming clearer why. Um, I want to share a poem with you. It's called Spirit Bond. And it describes the day that my dad left Barbados. It's called Spirit Bond, 1955-2007. We claim the sliver of balcony, the idle wharf, and the street below that well-oiled machine, and kill drinks with time. Inside the Spirit Bond, the walls drip with sepia-filtered memories. On the ground floor, arcades of men and boys plug into consoles while reality ultimately crawls and races by outside. In the pre programs the sun is like a Collins, slicing everything up and it leaves the Lewis Wickham lining. I left Barbados from somewhere about here. My father proclaims the schoolboy one And next thing we're ditching our drinks and heading down the boardwalk to the point where Bridgetown drops away into the sea. You can walk to the edge and drop away too. 
like migrant workers on evenings dropping fishing lines, or the couples on benches and picnic tables dropping guard, passers-by dropping blades, but all somehow on edge. Come, let me go there now. And we go there now. History leaping at us of schooners, lighters and tugboats, ferrying generations to ships that would carry them away. Into the unknown. My father remembers he was late the day he left. His brother driving like a madman, spikes down to Bridgetown, the car stalling, old man on a bicycle wobbling, a narrow miss, last minute voyager, suitcase tumbling, the final passenger aboard the tug waiting. The SS Hubert, not yet past the point of no return. We are standing on terra firma, pathway winding through beautified shrub and new street furniture. All here is water, he says. At least he thinks so. Yes, back then this is ocean. I blink into the sun and see lines of hope decked in travelling vests, stretching far into the water, taking next steps. Back at the bond, it is cool and dark. We kill time with another round and later leave the way we came. Men and boys still parked at ground level, playing games at the edge of our beings. Um, in a recent you know, conversation with my dad, he told me that he remembers his interview, the interview that he had when he decided that he was going to leave Barbados um, as part of, I think, what was then the hotel workers scheme. And he remembers going for his interview in Queen's Park under the bandstand there where the, 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 the um, police force play. Um, throngs and throngs of people, no queuing, very disorderly. Um, but you had already to have at least one document you know, to show that you had started the process. You showed your document and you got that in. He remembers he was interviewed by Peter Morgan. Peter Morgan, way, way, way back when. And obviously he got to take a stamp or whatever and he ended up to India. I, I wanted to write a couple of poems that really imagined that interview process. You know, a bit of hindsight, a bit of foresight, a bit of poetic license going on. So I have two poems. They fall under a banner called Love and War. The first one is called The Leave Slash Stay Application and Interview. Home or away? Mm -hmm. Foreign field or domestic front? Hurricane or snowdrift? Which one? Okay. Merciless sun or invisible one? Small island, big island, city, or continent? Yes. Now, regarding your passage, the payment. Ah, yes, thank you. Um, once you cross the water, what will you be doing to guarantee your guarantor won't land in Holland? Postal orders? Okay. And for the children that are left behind? For them too? Okay, good, good. And what will you be shipping, or later airlifting, besides yourself? Sweet bread? Mm -hmm. uh, that was baked the day of departure? Baked chicken? May not make it. Fish? Mm -hmm. Oh, oh. Okay. Uh, Determination? Muscle? Mother loads? Mother loads? Ooh, interesting, interesting. Any weapons? Ammunition? Uh -huh. Defense systems. Are you a coordinate shifted by history, necessity, or adventure? All three. Check. What work will you do once you reach? Yes, this relates to the question regarding your guarantor. So that you will be occupied as a postal worker, hotel worker, driving bus. Yes, working trains, uh -huh. nurse work, or 
cleaning ourselves, cleaning streets, digging trenches, claiming territory, standing ground, building castles. Oh, raising babies? Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Praising God? Facing head on whatever you might say? Hmm. Have you thought about baby clothes and furniture? You know, blankets, baby pots and such? How are you planning to reshape and reshape these back and forth between kids, kin and kindred? Mm. Along with the fruits of your kitchen and garden, believe me, it's important you should be serious. You'd be surprised. And how are your other survival skills? Your stories, your tales from home. You need good ones to go along with the new tales from the front combat, often from behind enemy lines, tales of lick up, knock up, sticks, bricks, stone faces, signs and windows, doors slammed shut, and liberal use of what will eventually be termed the N-word. You got your battle cry? Your drum? You know how to rally troops? And of course, you know about getting home in an emergency or whenever you feel the need. That will be in truce time. But for weddings, in the nick of time for funerals, and also really put, put them back for good if you truly desire before it's too late. You can tick the box indicating the colour for the last glimpse of sky you will have. We have gunmetal grey, slate grey, pale grey, and just simple grey. And um, of course, there also are also infinite varieties of blue. Yes, you do have a choice, though it may not feel like it. If and when you do return, you'll be unloading and checking your weapons at Stansted, Heathrow, Gatwick, Sewell initially, and then sometime in the future, Grand Adams International. Yeah, yeah, it's it for him. Yeah. You'll be converging all your separate and separated lives into one kitchen when you get back. That kitchen will be camouflaged in the union. And um, it, it should be a ceasefire. Well, expect friendly fire at most. There will be a sharing of notes, comparing of the price paid for this passage and the next, one way round trip, open return, and whose ship took the longest to reach their streets unpaved before. There will be a testing and retesting of memory, right and wrong recollection of when the call to cradle or rock your universe is first heard. So it will feel like war, but basically you'll be waging love on whatever front you're on for the next 15 years. Yes? That's right. Okay. Sign here. And here. And the other imagined interview is for my mum and her sister, and it's called Declaration Form. And if the one I just read was before the departure, this one is after the arrival. Declaration Form. Was the sky screw face the day you left? Did the wind in the cane field quarrel your name? Did the air cling like a second skin? Did heavens open? And were you crushed to leave the child with the boats? Did gullies and shoreline shrink back, shape shifting like a mother's belly after labor? What made you flee? the uneasy, overcrowded peace for a home among strangers, cast away among familiars, each passenger an island, each island remapping a route. Did your mind settle like floorboards and ceilings tightening at their seams, or did it churn with the Atlantic? Stumble about on deck, haunting the dawns in the dining halls, 
for those 17 days at sea. And the two small children, not yours, but in your care, were they delivered warmly into waiting winter coats or into long, empty arms? What grade of steel was that in the nun's eye or in the expression of sky on Southampton Dock? And what of your own cold comfort? Weren't you headed further north? <coughs> to get here. Not time, not distance. Selvin's lot had nothing on us, not one thing, not in that South London flat. We used that place like it was somewhere just a crash, remember? With leaves, scribbled notes, and phone messages for each other, with the loose change next to the mirror on the mantelpiece. And the parties you threw, like even college rooms, you with your crowd, me with mine, all cramped into that front room. The latest calypsos from home, the dancing, the laughter, the loud, long, nan, the loud, long talk, the food. Always the joke about not wasting too much of the Mount Gay from the libation. The people tracing up and down the stairs, floorboards still creaking at two in the morning. I brought these. I saw them outside Captain's station and couldn't resist. I remember how much you liked them. Colour, yes? It reminds me of the bananas and all the other fruit and produce we buy from Brixton Market. Brixton. Like a piece of Caribbean just got slapped down in South London. I remember you always wanted bananas. The colour. Maybe I should have bought those instead. This place you're in now, it's, it's very quiet. It's not like that flat at all. But tell me, where should I put these? I don't see a vase, I don't see a jar. It took real long to get here. Not the voyage by sea or the ones by plane. Not the train ride. Not the bus that carried me away. The taxi or the footsteps that brought me back. You know why I left. They transferred me. Midlands, remember? And after that, we had a job down south. Trips to London got fewer and fewer. And then that thing, you know, the thing. The time I came back from one of my trips home, we met at the airport and insisted, insisted on carrying my suitcase. Without a suitcase. Packed down with gifts and food. And, uh, you know that you're just not a true Bajan and mesh a suitcase and loaded down rum, fish, breadfruit, sweet bread. Up and down escalators we went, often on trains, across platforms, the walk home from Stockwell, tube station. Like you've had countless times before. We got back to the flat, had a light lunch, and some of that same very fine fish. I'd gone into the kitchen, and when I came back to get your plate, we were staring at the ceiling, just staring. I dialed 999. It wasn't a stroke, they said. You haven't had a stroke, Mr. the world. You had a fit. A fit, do you understand? They yelled it in that way that medical staff sometimes do to old folks and foreigners. And that was it. Epilepsy. Brought on by too much living. You'd waited until your 18th year to do it. When you came home, and I don't mean home home, I just mean that flat, things changed. No more booze, no more smokes, no more socializing or parties or dashing about South London, no more women half your it hit us both then that you were no longer that thick guy in his 80s who looked like 60, acted like 40, saw himself still as 20. The proud West Indian who breezed into England relatively late in life, a last wave windrusher, 
who was still vital, full of dreams and notions. Back home, home home, on the rock, we'd been a policeman, serving in the mounted division on a course named Sultan, torn between carrying out your duties and empathizing with the protesters during the 1937 riots. You were a swimmer, a strong one, had played water polo for the police team, an athletic man, a virile ladies' man, tall, broad-shouldered, uh, with ruddy, brick-brown complexion, a square jaw, and an aquiline nose, freckles scattered across high cheekbones. A man with cotton wool hair and hands like silk. Even after years of sorting parcels for London's GPO, working as a delivery man, doorman, taxi cab operator, chauffeur, boat repairman, a handyman, a free-spirited man who worked hard, played hard, had seen the sky over St. Lucia, Curacao, New York, and even Cyprus, had the broken relationships, wide, wide strewn children, with stories and some scars to show for it. Time caught up with you, stranded you in a cold climate. When your London life started to ebb, you did too. The rock was just a fond and distant memory. It took long to get here. Not the ships, planes, buses, trains, taxis, streets that carry us away or bring us back. Not time plus distance, but a feeling far heavier than a barbie and now we're in this new time and place. Look at us, all this talking. Just like the old days, and me still holding these. I've given up trying to arrange them. Doesn't make much sense, not in a place like this. How about I just leave them on the ground, right here by this bench? What's that? Throw them up in the air. Let them fall when they may. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Linda. That, that was quite a journey that we were on with you, and it's uh, not only a journey in our past, but something that we're going to be doing shortly also with our fe featured speaker, um, who is delivering a, a lecture as part of the series this year, an invitation to support the 70 years of the Windrush generation. Her talk is going to be on how we've been here before, Barbados' Windrush generation now, as the daughter of migrants myself to Canada with family who migrated to the US, Panama, Brazil, and the UK, and, and to Canada throughout the 20th century, I cannot tell you how inspirational Professor Chamberlain's work has been in my academic life. She has been the, has, she has a wonderful ability to take the stories we have all been hearing from family members and historicize them and that doesn't mean to make them boring. <laughs> it means to put them in a context, a historical context, especially with care and sensitivity. Mary Chim Chamberlain is Emeritus Professor of Caribbean History at Oxford Brookes University and the author of several landmark studies on 20th century Caribbean history, including Narratives of Exile and Return, Family Love in the Diaspora, Migration and the Anglo-Caribbean Experience, an empire and nation building in the Caribbean, Barbados 1937 to 1966. Her work engages with oral histories, with the role and importance of families and intergenerational influences on migration, as well as the impact of migration on political consciousness. Her work has been widely cited and is highly acclaimed. She has also authored a number of books on women's history, and she is considered a pioneer in oral history and has been a member of a number of a member of a number of governmental editorial and advisory committees relating to the Caribbean migration and oral history. She is a trustee of the Raphael Samuel Liter History Center and an advisor to the National Life Story Collection at the British Library. 
She has had visiting professorships at New York University and the University of the West Indies. Uh, Mary is also a novelist. Uh, this is an another part of her life. Um, her first novel, The Mighty Jester, was published in 2014. Her second, The Dressmaker of Dachau, was in, published in 2016 and has been translated into 19 languages and was an international bestseller. Her most recent novel, uh, published this year, The Hidden, was a Sunday Times must-reads choice of the recent books and Choice Magazine's book of the month. What has also recently inspired me about Professor Chamberlain's life, which I was not aware of, was that in 1972, she, along with some other young, bright things and white people, were recruited by the ANC, the African National Congress, to smuggle anti-apartheid literature into South Africa at a time when the ANC presses had been smashed and its infrastructure decimated. They passed undetected below the regime's racial radar, and the so-called London recruits, as they now call, uh, have they now been called, played a critical role in the rebuilding of the ANC and its struggle against apartheid. A documentary film is now being made about their contribution. I would like you to join me in providing a very warm welcome to Professor Chamberlain. It's my very, very great honor to welcome you to the It's very bright here. Um, but thank you, Dr. Innes, for the generous words of introduction. And thank you also, the Barbados Museum and the University of the West Indies, for inviting me to give this talk within your timely series. I'm delighted to be back in Barbados, a country I first came to 32 years ago. And every time I return and step into the warmth of the Bayesian air, it feels like coming home. But I have to say, Linda, you're a hard act to follow on this one. I'd like, however, to start with a short quotation from Roy, whom I interviewed in the mid-1990s. They didn't come out of Panama because they wanted to, he said. They were thrown out. So, imagine me in Britain and I'm not writing to my brother, my niece. Should I be surprised when I come here now? They resent me. He then went on with eerie prescience. Or imagine that I'm going to be in England forever, in the English way of life. Then circumstances dictate, and I have to be back here. Barbadians and other West Indians are no strangers to the histories of invitation and deportation. The discussion last week looked at Britain's changing immigration policy in the light of Brexit and the subsequent Windrush scandal, which denied benefits. Sorry, the, the, the light is actually making it quite difficult for me to read. If that could um, which denied benefits to detained and in many cases deported British citizens of Caribbean heritage. Guy Hewitt, your High Commissioner at the time, played a critical role in exposing the scandal and seeking redress for its victims. What I'll try to do this week is to explore some of the historical precedents and possible nationalist antecedents of these policies and to place what is now called the Windrush Migration, a rather sloppy shorthand for what is an immensely complex and historically nuanced moment in its 20th century perspective. But I want to start in the early years of the 20th century. Between 1904 and 1914, approximately 50,000 Barbadians roughly one in four of the population, migrated to work in the Panama region. By then, the Barbados legislature had overcome its objection to migration 
and permitted the ICC, the Isthmian Canal Commission, to recruit labor in Bridgetown. Some of those who migrated remained on the Isthmus. Some returned to Barbados, some re-migrated to Central and South America, or to Cuba and the Dominican Republic in the Caribbean. Many more went to the United States, swelling the ranks of those who were already there. Between 1899 and 1931, nearly 108,000 Caribbean-born people had emigrated to the United States. Now, these migrants brought back more than money. They brought back experience of families, of organization, and of contingency. Since the 19th century, at least, Caribbean families have been criticized by British colonial authorities as weak and deviant groupings, a stereotype reiterated by Thomas Symey, who notoriously described them as disintegrate in 1946. Yet it was these families who took care of migrants' dependents where necessary and, where possible, raised the costs of migrants' travel. In return, Barbadians sent back remittances in cash or kind and, whenever circumstances permitted, returned for longer or shorter periods. These remittances were used to supply families with current expenditure and capital sums, improve the social opportunities and circumstances of all family members, while migrants in the destination countries received family and friends and helped them on their way. Families at both ends of the journey were the bedrock of that migration, a feature which persisted throughout the 20th century. Indeed, many families became increasingly to rely on migration and actively promoted or supported the subsequent journeyings of its members to the extent that many scholars, including myself, have talked about a culture of migration and a family ethos or dynamic of migration. But the consequences deriving from this early migratory experience were profound. West Indians met other West Indians from across the Caribbean. In Panama, the scale of the migration brought home to many the scale of the poverty that all were experiencing throughout the British West Indies. In Panama, as well, they also shared an understanding of the contemporary racialized experience as employees of the American and Jim Crow-dominated ICC, an experience echoed for those who went to or were already in the United States. It was, wrote the Jamaican poet Claude Mackay, the first time I've ever come face to face with such manifest, implacable hate of my race. One response was to attempt to distance themselves from African Americans by emphasizing a West Indian distinctiveness, a pattern replicated elsewhere. Thus, British West Indians who remained in Panama into the 1930s and established families there affirmed their island identity across generations, despite pressures to conform. In 1933, Dr. Hamodio Arias, president of the Republic of Panama and, incidentally, an admirer of Adolf Hitler, complained bitterly to Sir Josiah Crosby, head of the British legation, about the, and I quote, many colored old timers here who retained their British language, culture, and customs, and affiliated themselves to the various local West Indian colonial associations. West Indians in Cuba, of whom 40% were Barbadians, similarly adhered to a range of West Indian organizations which served to support the community and maintain a distinctive identity. 
Similarly, the 10,000 or so West Indians in the Dominican Republic affected by the ultra-nationalist legislation, sorry, affected by the ultra-nationalist Rafael, Rafael Trujillo's 1934 legislation, which sought the Dominicanization of labor, displayed what he called, what the British ambassador called a distinctive and assertive presence, which was noted did not endear them to the Dominicans who professed to regard them as aggressive and quarrelsome. The rationales for such assertive and protective behavior in Panama, Cuba, and the Dominican Republic were similar to those operating in the United States, racism and economic discrimination. It's not surprising, therefore, that migrants responded to the particular racial hierarchies and configurations they encountered in ways which provided both support for each other and differentiation from other African Caribbean and African Americans, forming clubs and associations which served as a foci of identification, performed valuable services, maintained island customs and traditions, and continued to emphasize the British connection, until, that is, the British refused to condemn the Italian invasion of Ethiopia. In the United States in particular, West Indians established newspapers, led protests, and formed political parties. They created branches of the UNIA, or the African Blood Brotherhood, or pan-Caribbean organizations, such as the West Indian Workers' Progressive Society. They organized to survive. They organized to resist. In this white man world, the character in Brown Girl, Brown Stones, the Barbadian America, Paul Marshall's novel, Invasion in Brooklyn, said, you got to take your mouth and make a gun. Race became weaponized. As Trumper, the returning migrant in George Lamming's novel, Those Interwar Years in the Castle of My Skin, put it, Paul Robeson, he said, one of the greatest of my people. What people? I asked. I was a bit puzzled. My people, said Trumper, the Negro race. Marcus Garvey of the UNIA had been in the FBI sites since his arrival in the United States in 1916, along with other West Indians who were rocking the racial boat. In 1927, Garvey was deported to Jamaica, but not before legislation passed in 1924, a year after Garvey's arrest, closed off the United States as a destination for West Indians. Thereafter, West Indians wishing to enter the United States had to come in if they could, and most could not, under metropolitan, that is, European quotas. Following on from the 1924 Aliens Act in the United States, legislation riding the tide of racist ultranationalism was passed in the Caribbean in the 1930s, which either divested black West Indians of their rights, as in Panama, or, as in the case of the Dominican Republic, expelled them. Many of them would have been in their host countries for 20, if not 30 years, and considered themselves safe and settled, not denied rights they'd grown to expect, much less to be deported. This ultra-nationalist, racist, and inward focus in the Americas, as well as in Europe, was one response to the economic crises of the 1920s and 1930s, which disturbed the bedrock of economic confidence, creating what the South African photographer Santu Mofuken described, albeit in the context of apartheid South Africa, as a state of anxiety. One way the brain works in such a condition was, he argued, to retreat to invention, fantasy, and paranoia. The lessons of the 1930s were not lost on West Indians, as Roy, who I quoted at the beginning, testified, 
His uncles and aunts had migrated to the United States and he himself had worked there during the Second World War. The importance of him of maintaining family networks, pumping and priming the social capital was the essence of survival. Imagine, if you remember, if circumstances dictate and I have to be back here. Let me turn now to the second largest wave of migration from Barbados after Panama to Britain in the 1950s and 60s, when over 27,000, or approximately 10% of the population, migrated within about a decade. Throughout the 1940s, the overpopulation problem was a major preoccupation, if not of the colonial office, certainly of its representatives on the ground. Sir Frank Stockdale, the controller of development and welfare, wrote regularly on the problems it posed to any form of social development. In his estimation, 50,000 Barbadians needed to emigrate and permanently. The Second World War created one opportunity, though for temporary migrations. As early as 1941, the colonial functionary Major Peebles put forward a scheme to send white Barbadians to Britain for war work. But by 1941, the Americans were recruiting for labor and Barbadians began to move to Bermuda, St. Lucia and Trinidad to work on the actual or anticipated US bases, as well as to the USA itself to work on the farm worker program. Once the war ended, however, so too did the possibilities for overseas labor. And once again, the Barbadian government were looking for solutions to the problem of overpopulation and underemployment. Post-war Britain emerged as a destination, heralded in 1948 by the arrival of the former troop carrier, the SS Windrush, and its passenger list of mainly ex-servicemen. Between 1951 and 1954, some Barbadians left for Britain, though their numbers could be counted in the hundreds. In 1955, the numbers jumped dramatically, partly as a result of Hurricane Janet, mainly as a result of the Barbadian government, which had been promoting Britain as a destination, courting prospective employers, establishing a sponsorship scheme, and offering loans for would-be migrants. In 1955, it launched the Barbados Immigrants Welfare and Liaison Service in London under the guidance of Harold Brewster to promote Barbadians as the elite of Caribbean workers, to secure employment opportunities, and of course, to ensure repayment of government loans for the migrants. While Barbadians may have been enthusiastic about the possibilities offered by Britain, the British had been and remained more ambivalent. Although the colonial secretary had welcomed the possibilities migration offered to reduce the population problem in Barbados in the first two decades of the 20th century, it did not welcome the increased political awareness that followed in its wake. Throughout the 1920s and 1930s, Scotland Yard kept Government House in Barbados regularly informed of potential agitators, all of whom were migrants or returning migrants operating in Barbados and the wider region. Within the UK, it kept a wary eye on the activities of West Indians and Africans, ever mindful of, on the one hand, the mutiny in 1918 by the men of the West Indian Regiment, and on the other, the riots in the port cities of Britain in 1919, directed at seamen of colour, many from the Caribbean and their families. Although the aggressors were white, the police arrested and charged a disproportionately high number of black victims, many of whom were deported back to the Caribbean. Although London before the war was not the destination for large-scale migrations, there were 
Nevertheless, significant numbers of West Indians and Africans domiciled there, including any number of radicals agitating for independence, the end of imperialism, and against racism. Like the FBI in the United States, the British Special Branch had a field day monitoring the plethora of organizations, publications, and people emanating from the black left. British and colonial authorities regarded black West Indians as inherently hot-headed, untrustworthy, and inferior. The Second World War did nothing to dispel those attitudes. Barbadians of what they called pure European descent were welcome in the British armed services, less so African Barbadians. 200 men recruited for training and engineering work in the United Kingdom in 1942 were still in Barbados two months later. Many Barbadians who later signed up with the armed services found themselves remaining in the Caribbean or, if sent overseas, not seeing active service. Funny, you know, Wesley, who spent his service years in Trinidad, recalled, even during times of war, prejudice steps in and they don't want any black people to be seen fighting in active areas. A War Office memo referred to, and I quote, Lieutenant General Alfrey, the commander of the British troops in Egypt, who spoke disparagingly of the West Indies, West Indians. General Nye also said he had a low opinion of them. The War Office didn't want to take them out of the West Indies, and the commanders who received them were equally unwilling. After the war, Britain's reconstruction program required more labor than it could supply at home or find from Europe its first preference. Despite the shortage, and despite colonial office awareness of unemployment in the Caribbean, encouraging colonial workers to come to Britain was regarded with initial abhorrence. Moving colonial labor within the empire was one thing. Moving it to Britain was another. Colonials, at least non-white colonials, should aspire to be like the mother country, but not to come to it. The arrival of the SS Windrush threw the authorities in a moral and social spin. They had no idea what to do with them, apart from housing them in an old air raid shelter in Clapham Common and directing them to the nearest labor exchange in Brixton. West Indians were a worrying enigma. As the Moyne Commission put it, and I quote, the Negro's transfer to the West Indies did not involve the transfer of any important traces of their traditions and customs, but rather their complete destruction. And no systematic attempt was made to substitute any others. Stripped of what they considered native culture and the brutalizing process of slavery, but given nothing back to replace it, the British held West Indians in contempt as both devoid of culture and principles upon which to organize families or society. They, and I quote, lack any such distinctive and exclusive social organization and culture as Sheila Patterson, one of the early chroniclers of West Indians in Britain observed in 1964. It is precisely the immigrant's intention not to live like pigs, Elizabeth Huxley, another commentator, observed in the same year, they want to adopt British standards. Contrary to a popular understanding in the United Kingdom that the migrants to Britain were predominantly unskilled workers, they were, like those who went to Panama and America before them, drawn from a range of the skilled as well as the unskilled. Some had government loans and sponsorship. Some, like the Panama men before them, relied on family to raise the money for the ticket, on the understanding that the government or the family loans would be repaid, remittances would be returned, 
and loved ones left behind would be cared for by family. Beulah's mother emigrated, leaving her in the care of her great-grandmother. And, as she said, religiously, every month, she, mother, sent our money. She also used to send parcels, lovely clothes. Looking back, it couldn't have been easy for her to amass them and toys. Most of those who came to Britain in the first instance were young men and women with memories of parents or grandparents or other close family members migrating to Panama, Cuba, Trinidad or the United States. I love listening, said one informant, whose grandmother had migrated to Trinidad, then Panama and Jamaica before returning to Barbados. To the old fellas, telling stories about how they went off to Curacao and they went off to Panama and they was building the canal and they went off to Cuba and Aruba and they found the oil. They'd grown up too as the beneficiaries of the migration of a parent or other family members through remittances and other forms of mutual support. They had elementary education and some, thanks partly to remittances, a secondary education, a strong bargaining chip in the view of Harold Brewster in his quest for employment opportunities. Many of the men in particular had gone to work for the Americans in the Second World War. They knew the form. And Britain, like Panama before, had, been, had become something of a craze. I just got up like that, one man said, just like that, and decide, because I had some friends coming along. All of a sudden, seeing people, because that was the norm then, everybody wants to try and go to England. Another person said, everybody right back, giving you encouragement to come over, to travel. I think this word travel, I think that's it. They just want you to travel and see somewhere else. While the Barbadian and colonial authorities had looked at emigration as a permanent re relief to overpopulation, most Barbadians who came to Britain thought their sojourn would be temporary, from three to five years. The previous models of migration, replicated through families, had been short-term, permeated with the expectation of return. My plans, said Geoffrey, was to start out five, <coughs> five years in England. From England, go to America, Canada, do a bit of traveling, get a lot of money, and go back to Barbados and build a right nice house. They left behind husbands, wives, and lovers, children, parents, and siblings, assuming it will be temporary and the heartache could be endured. When I get to the airport, one woman said, and the plane take off, is then I realize I was up in the air that I really leave my children, you know? I burst out crying. I was hysterical. Can you believe it? Another informant said. I looked back at the children. Oh, my heart bled. I cried many a night on the ship. Barbadians have been educated on a diet of British history, geography and literature, on empire and loyalty, where the inner sentiments of the colonial office have been hidden from view. Barbados have been presented as the mother country, the antithesis of the impoverishment of the islands. Up to when I left for England in 1956, one man said, I had nothing but a 100% good picture of England and everybody else that is in England. I felt I was going to a place which would be second to heaven, and that's true. Barbadians came to Britain with expectations about migration and the mother country, which were at variance with what the mother country thought about migration and West Indians. They arrived in a country broken by war and in cities still devastated by it compounding the residual poverty of the interwar years. There was an acute housing shortage in which West Indians found themselves at the bottom of a racialized pecking order. You go to the newspaper shop 
and you see the various advertisements, and then you'll see no Irish, no coloured, some you just see no coloured. Another person said, going round looking for rooms or whatever to rent or a flat, you know, vacancy to let. Well, by the time you got there, they just slammed the door. They opened and slammed the door. Even Harold Brewster had difficulty finding accommodation for his recruits, who often ended up sharing rooms and sometimes beds. They encountered racism in employment. West Indian people like us were treated completely differently. You did the worst job, the most menial job, the filthy jobs. They didn't think you could read and write. I happen to know a chap, another person said, who automatically sapped himself. He refused to take the bus any further with a coloured conductor. They encountered it in shops. People didn't want to serve you. You have to put your money on the counter. They never touch your hand. They encountered cruelty and indifference. Roy and his family were living in Notting Hill in the midst of the riots there in 1958. They lived above a club which was set on fire. You got the choice, he said, of either having to stand and get roast or go out and get a bottle or a chain in your head. Although the fire brigade put out the fire, he goes on, no one ever came and knock on the front door and ask us, are you all right? How you feel? Are you in shock? How are the children? Nothing. It never happened. The difficulties were not reported home, partly to put a brave face on things, partly not to worry anxious parents. We wrote, we okay, and we both fine, and it's cold, and things like that. But we never really told her that it was that bad. We never did, because she'd pine and worry. Partly also, that was the migrant way. Where the people was up there, another person said, and didn't want to say what they were going through, or people, even if they hear things, they probably won't believe it. They probably don't tell it to anybody else. It was a cultural, if not cognitive, dissonance. There were charges of duplicity from the start between the promises offered and the work or training provided. Many of the nurses, for instance, were unhappy at receiving a training as a state enrolled nurse when they'd been led to believe they'd be trained for the superior qualification of state registered nurse. Despite labour shortage, finding work was not easy. Barbadians and other West Indians sometimes struggled to find suitable employment or to repay the loans to family or the Barbadian government while also paying the bills in Britain. Many experienced a de-skilling. Byron had been a school teacher in Barbados but got a job as a postman in Britain. Not out of choice, he said. I started as a postman because it was the only way I could get entry into the system. What Bayesians found was, as Roy put it, in short, the English could teach hypocrisy better than anybody else on earth. But Barbadians had survival skills honed elsewhere in previous migrations. They had entered networks of kin and close friends in Britain who received them in the new country and provided accommodation, money, local knowledge, and down the line, more formal financial support in the shape of benefit and mutual aid societies. Both informal and formal support were based on levels of trust forged through village connections back home and neighbourhood connections in foreign. In the early days, they shared accommodation, creating households and mutual support, sharing resources and responsibilities, creating micro-neighbourhoods. All the back people knew one another, another lady said. So this is how we all mucked in, visited one another. We were like a little close-knit neighbourhood again, and we were happy. You always kept together. They used their grapevines to secure employment for each other and companionship. There was always grapevines. I live in North London, and some of my mates that went to school with me was living in South East. 
It was quite a fine group of vines. I found that everything that was good, work, accommodation, friends, cricket. They used meeting terms to raise the finance to purchase houses. They created church communities, Saturday schools and welfare organisations. They organised politically and with other Caribbean people were in the vanguard in the pushback against racial discrimination, partly through the efforts of activists such as Claudia Jones, partly through organisations such as CARD, the Campaign Against Racial Discrimination, or the West Indian Standing Conference, which culminated in the Race Relations Act of 1965 and 68. They organised culturally, from the West Indian Students Association and the Caribbean Artists Movement, from Notting Hill Carnival, a direct response to the race riots of 1958, to the establishment of bookshops, publishers, newspapers and journals. They put skills from home, tailoring, carpentry, teaching, at the service of their neighbours. They took on more than one job to make ends meet. In other words, they created spaces of material, financial and psychological support and ensured a continuing contact with the values and cultures of home. Far from lacking a distinctive culture, it proved a forceful and highly adaptive structure through which and from which Barbadian migrants were able to operate, draw strength and confirm an identity, much as they had in Panama, Cuba or New York. The financial rewards in Britain were, however, slow to be reaped. Pay was low, accommodation scarce. Barbados was a long way away and return travel was expensive. It's not so bloody marvellous, one exasperated woman wrote to the Labour Department in Barbados, living on six pounds a week, four pounds, ten shillings for rent and the rest to buy food, paraffin and the lot. Think, and think hard what it's like. Some Barbadians returned home, broke and broken. For those who stayed, three years became five, and five became ten. Individual migrants sent for other family members. They sent for their children. They gave birth to more children in Britain. Family reunions were not always smooth, and both children and adults sometimes took time to adjust. Nevertheless, a different pattern of long-term micro-settlement began to emerge as Barbadians established homes and put their children into school and began to encounter then a whole other level of racism institutionalised in the education system, in the police, the judiciary and sadly the prisons. From an early age, one young Barbadian said, a child meets racism here. You're not made to feel welcome here. Why should you fight to have to why should you have to fight to become accepted? You shouldn't have to do that. If a white kid gets born tomorrow, he's accepted. So why shouldn't my children be accepted? That first generation of Barbadians arrived in Britain confident that, through the nineteen forty eight Nationality Act, they were citizens of the United Kingdom and its colonies, that they were, for all intents and purposes, British. But they entered a Britain with a history of racial intolerance and among the majority of its citizens, ignorance of the colonies and of colonial conditions. I want to park that for a moment and turn very briefly to British immigration policy in the 20th century which starts with the 1905 Aliens Act. As the title suggests, aliens were by definition not welcome. The 1905 legislation was passed to control not only immigrant entry into the UK, but to mollify public alarm, we might say prejudice, of what was considered uncontrolled and undesirable immigration, particularly Jewish immigration. This anti-immigrant, racist and anti-Semitic sentiment 
had not subsided during the years of the First World War. If anything, it intensified during the war. Indeed, one of the explanations for attacks on black seamen in 1919 may be rooted in this anti-immigrant climate. This legislation was amended throughout the 1920s, 1930s and 1940s to adjust to and control European refugees and displaced persons. The arrival of West Indians from 1948, immediately after the Second World War, followed by Asians from the Indian subcontinent, prompted the first of the Immigration Acts restricting Commonwealth immigration in 1962, a hasty response to the kind of public outcry that had preceded and led to the 1905 Aliens Act. It was followed by further legislation in 1965, 68, 1971 and 1981. As Andrea Stewart has pointed out, the name Windrush was never shorthand as it might have been at the beginning of the modern post-colonial era. Instead, it came to symbolise in the public mind the dangers of migration. These immigration acts targeted at new Commonwealth citizens, for which read black citizens, had echoes of the legislation passed three decades earlier and well within living or generational memory in the Hispanic Caribbean and the United States. Not exactly the same, I know, but sufficiently reminiscent to raise alarm bells. But it also coincided with the end of empire and for Barbadians, the push for independence in the Caribbean first through the ill starred Federation, then Jamaican and Trinidadian independence, and finally that of Barbados in 1966. Home had become a place of pride, an independent nation, in addition to a place of belonging. Roy declared himself a real patriot, a real Bayesian, when we got independence, after crying actual tears for joy that we had received independence I then sent off a telegram to the Prime Minister, who was then Errol Barrow, and I sent off to the Colonial Secretary. So my patriotism is there, it's been, it's intact. The Notting Hill riots of 1958, the murder of Kelso Cochrane the following year, the support for the fascist union movement and the white defence lead was followed in the 1960s and 70s by legislation tightening immigration against a backdrop of anxiety in the UK created by Britain's loss of empire and global status. At the same time, politicians such as Enoch Powell inflamed white sentiment just as vigilante teddy boys continued to raise the temperature of racism and the climate of hostility, little tempered by the Race Relations Acts. In such circumstances, many parents consciously transferred a notion of Barbados to their British children, reinforcing it with visits home when they could afford it and maintaining close ties with relatives there. Barbados provided an additional, positive and ultimately alternative identity. This was fueled from the 1970s when British policies of racial and cultural assimilation gave way to multiculturalism, legitimating diversity and multiple identities. Reclaiming or claiming the Caribbean heritage was a positive act of engagement, as well as an insurance against attack. Barbados, Sharon, the British-born Bayesian said, it was like you came home from school and you came through your front door and you were in Barbados. You were very much in Barbados. In fact, we all refer to Barbados as home, and it's always home. And yet we were born and raised here. Even now, my husband says, Barbados is not your home. Britain's your home. But yet I still say, home, you know, I'm going home. Yet many of those British-born or reared Barbadians express an ambivalence. How do I identify myself? At school, he was black. 
West Indian in England. You see, it varies. Realistically, I'm British, black British. I have no ambitions at the end of the day to go back to the West Indies unless things get really bad here. I'm trying to look for a final word to say what I am. I'm black, that's a fact. I suppose British West Indian. I don't know how you term that, how you sort it out. Multiple shifting identities, mobile locations, havens in a storm, if circumstances dictate. Where do you turn? If I fly to Barbados tomorrow, another informant said, I know that I can go to any one of my sisters and I have a bed to sleep on. If I go to Toronto and I seek out my cousin, I know he's going to open the door to me. So I think that's where family links are very important. Which brings me to my penultimate point and back where I began with families and the importance of maintaining transnational and indeed multinational links. As I suggested, migration has always been a family endeavor and family has been and is central to a Caribbean social identity. Knowing your family, as one informant said, is knowing yourself. Family inclusiveness and connectivity is the critical component of transnational families. And as the diaspora widens, so do the links. Help now by easier communications, cheap flight, WhatsApp, FaceTime, Skype. It's easy to stay in touch, to maintain and establish links across generations and across oceans, and important. In my work on families, what was stressed over and over was the closeness of family. To me, one person said, family, is like religion. Families always come first. I strongly believe, another said, that you should never forget your roots. Another British born Bayesian said, I'm actually really proud of Caribbean families. That was something we'll always retain. We have a family reunion now, said another informant. New York, every two years, yes. Every year it become bigger. A few hundred, I would say. How many tables it was? About 30. Imagine, said Roy, that I'm going to be in England forever, in the English way of life, then circumstances dictate. And circumstances did dictate. Throughout the 1990s and the noughties, Britain's state of anxiety, induced by the loss of empire, and by the perceived loss of sovereignty to the European Union, which had been wickedly vilified as the enemy, compounded in 2008 with the worst financial crisis since the 1929 crash. The brain, in a state of anxiety, as Moffat Ken observed, moves towards paranoia. In 2010, the then Home Secretary, Theresa May, launched her hostile environment, a vote-winning policy to curb the entry into Britain of what were termed with inflammatory rhetoric, bogus asylum seekers and illegal immigrants. Under the policy, anyone suspected of being an illegal immigrant had to prove their legal right to remain, or for those born in the UK, the legal right of their parents to remain. Writes that, the Caribbean and other new Commonwealth peoples predated the 1971 legislation. We're familiar with the consequences, so I won't say more except this. Black faces stand out in a white crowd and in a febrile, ultra-nationalist climate that reached its zenith with Brexit, but which had been building for decades, elderly Caribbean people were easy targets. And still, despite denials, there is evidence of racial profiling of immigrants. For more British black nationals are subject to immigration checks than any other foreign or any other nationality. Yes, I think we've been here before. But let me end with the words of the veteran Calypsonian Sterling Betancourt. When the Windrush docked at Tilbury, 
and Lord Kitchener sang, London is the place for me. But he didn't know, after 70 years, Windrush children would be in tears, and London would be a Brexit city. Thank you. I didn't think that she would disappoint. As, a, as somebody I've been studying for a, a very long time, I'm completely moved and must thank you for a wonderful lecture, very deliberate and provoking. And I know that we are going to have some excellent questions from our audience. I would invite you to come to the two mics that are in the aisles there. And uh, please keep your questions brief. But if you do have any questions or a brief comment to make, I would invite you to, to make that at this point. Are you so blown away <laughs> by such a, a comprehensive lecture? Um, please, please make your way to the, to the, just so that, because we're capturing it on video, it would be nice to, to be able to hear what the question is. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my question is, um, we talked about the Caribbean community forming in London, in the UK, and working together, and there's a community spirit. We're not seeing that in London now. What we're seeing is young children fighting over postcodes and stabbings and things like that. What changed? When, when did it change? Did the community stop and we move to this kind of fighting and nonsense? Oh, <laughs> I think it requires somebody slightly more expert in this than me. I don't know. I mean, I think a lot of it, and you know, people say this, and it's not just me, is the result of education deprivation, employment deprivation, housing deprivation, you know, austerity. I mean, we've had I all those things, but it made us a stronger community. Sorry. You talked about all of those things being yeah. placed on arrival, causing a yeah. strong Caribbean community, but now those same things are causing this fractiousness. I just wondered whether there was anything in your research that you pointed out. I, I haven't, future. yeah. I mean, it's a really, really good question. And I haven't, you know, I haven't looked into that. Um, but, you know, the, the it's what, second, third generation. Um, many of whom live on benefits, um, you know, or who struggle in all sorts of ways. I, you know, I don't, I really don't know what the answer to that is or what the cause of it is. I mean, you know, drugs are freely available, um, you know, <laughs> attacks on masculinity so that, you know, these young lads, and they are mainly lads, feel that somehow being a member of a gang is you know, gives them an identity, gives them a belonging. Um, it's, I think there's a whole raft of really complex issues that are playing into this, which differentiate them from their parents' generation. But having said this, I mean, it was their, you know, it was those children, um, you know, who, who came over as children or were born in Britain, who began to experience, you know, the institutionalized racism in in the sense that you know it was um, agencies of the government you know education judiciary and so forth uh, and you know it's their children now maybe even their grandchildren who are you know disintegrating in those communities and you know this is three two three generations of attacks and austerity I don't know, what do you think? <laughs> I I'm just wondering, because we talk about all the solutions to what's happening seem to be formed in what we did when we arrived. Mm. So we formed those financial communities and people that save and buy homes and support each other. And I'm just wondering, because I was raised in an environment where we talk about coming home because our ex was home, even though I wasn't born here. Mm. But I now have dual nationality. But I, I just find that 
something changed. And mm. I talked to friends and I said, well, when did it change? When we were growing up, we saw another black person who nodded and smiled. Mm. And I learned that from my dad. Yeah. He'd see somebody, you know who it was, but he would acknowledge them. Yeah. But now, yeah. children look at each other and it's like, why well, can't be? Yeah, and absolutely. And something changed, something was yeah. lost, but wasn't yeah. passed on. And I sort of know whether there was a point in time that you... Well, uh, I... <laughs> You know, I think attempts were made to pass it on. I mean, um, but, you know, I mean, it's just been a, a fairly relentless um, list or catalogue of issues that the black community in particular have had to deal with in the UK. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, sorry, I, don't, I wish I knew what the answer was, I really do. I haven't lived in England since 1966. I came here because I came to work in schools and I'm a foreign languages teacher, being a foreign languages teacher, and I married to a Grenadian whom I met at university in England. I visit, visit my family from time to time in England. I haven't obviously been involved particularly in Afro-Caribbean or Afro um, communities when I've been there, but I um, do notice that it's not just the African, Afro-based communities. There's so many different communities now that were never there in my childhood. I was born in 1942 in England, so I was accustomed to a multicultural situation from early, early, early. My father had been in India since 1919, colonial too. Um, but I, then, I wasn't responsible for where I was born. <laughs> um, but I remember the 1950s. And I remember getting, when I went to school in the 50s, we got on the bus and we occasionally saw an African face. I was excited by it, I must say. Mm. But I, don't, I didn't, really wasn't involved in the other side, the painful side of it. But I do notice now um, obviously, people have—they uh, try to um, unite people, and send people to schools. But I know there's still privileged schools and other schools, and uh, they have the problem where communicating with people is not necessarily, the, you know, getting on and giving of yourself and sharing with the different community, different type background communities is not necessarily what you do. Because I lived in suburbia when I grew up. I, as I, um, I was, went to school in Croydon and um, I lived outside Croydon. But I studied overseas so and I guess I'm, not, um, I'm accustomed to mixing with all kinds of people. But um, I, as I say, I do think that um, I remember going into a store um, in the West End and uh, <laughs> I, I was walking in, I saw so this elderly old lady and I started talking to her and, you know, I said, how are you? And she, she was like this, all bent up and so on. And um, I said to her, um, uh, how are you? She said, I think you're pretty well, but you have some problems. I said, what's your problems? It's those darkies. And I said, oh, well, um, I'm married to one and she's skid up a lot. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we laugh, but it's sad. Yes. It's really sad. Yes. It's really sad that we can't get on. I mean, I, I here obviously I've been in classrooms. I've taught at secondary level. I've been in classrooms teaching foreign languages. I was the only white person. I was aware I was aware I was white. It didn't matter. People are people, and that's what I'm. You know, that's my mantra. Really. Mm. Well, I think in the schools. I mean, the children. You know. I mean, certainly when my children were at school and now with grandchildren. I mean, um, you know, they have friends from, you know, they have black friends, they have Asian friends, they have Eastern European friends. You would not know, you know, from when they come home and they talk about whoever. You know, there's absolutely no kind of identifications along the lines of race. So it is, you know, it is in some ways much more, well it is, you know, it's certainly in London, I can't speak for elsewhere, a very multicultural society. 
yes. um, which has now been sort of ripped asunder yes. by um, by the far right. I mean, I'm not going to mince my words. Who yes. seem to have taken over? But I must say one thing to Bob Williams that my husband is very aware that he's Canadian and he's very aware that it's different. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for your, your comment. If we could have others who wish to ask questions, if they could just line up behind the, the microphones. Mr. Thank Larry. you, uh, Dr. Chamberlain. I would like to congratulate you for a most in-depth study of the migration process. And the challenges that that would pose for both Caribbean people in particular and Europeans. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, your, your presentation is sound, but I'd like you to consider one aspect that you did not touch on. You spoke of the 1958 riots. And then you jump to the 1962 legislations. I'd like you to focus on the 1959 Mental Health Act. Because that is at the center of the British immigration policies. Let me tell you why. So we appreciate that. And I really would like you to put that into mm -hmm. because after the 1958 race rights, Nottingham Gates and Nottingham, the 1959 Mental Health was introduced. 1959 Mental Health Act was introduced. Before 1958 and 59, there were hardly any black people in the mental institutions. Following that act in 1959, people were picked up by the police, they were sent to the mental institution. They were if you went to court, the court would send them from the courts to the mental institutions. If they were in prison, they could be sent from prison to the mental institutions. And the home secretary can send them back to where they were born. And that was the first time in the British legal system that a person could be, who was born in British, or British subject, can be deported legally. I also make the point of the first, the person who are first question. It was unfair to pose that to you because you were doing your research as a researcher, but you were not living the experience. Yeah. Yes, we got together because Racism hit us just like the snow. We couldn't separate the two. When we were here, we did not understand racism. And most of us still don't. 
when we got there, we understood it quite clearly. Now, the young people from the 1960s and 70s have been experiencing racism. They're not understanding it because they are living through it. Before understanding, I visited uh, Britain recently, last year, on two occasions, and what I found is for the first time, because I'm a specialist, I'm a race relations consultant, and one of the best, I will say this, in racism awareness training and black consciousness raising. My name is Buddy Larry. I'm renowned for that. That was my speciality in Britain. Okay? Now, what I realized in Britain recently is that white people are now talking about racism without being any, having any fears. Which when we were there, that was not the case. And this, I end at this point. White people don't know they're white because no one told them they were white. You know, people were black and the opposite to black is white, but because they are not the focus, they never understand that they were white. If you ask a white person, what does it feel like to be white? They won't know what the answer. But if you ask a black people, a black person, they'll give you a history of what it is. And that's my point. Yeah. Thank you. I think you made yeah. I think you made three really, really important points. Um, you know, white people need to be aware, educated, so forth. The Mental Health Act, thank you very much for pointing that out. Um, again, I mean, if you look at statistics, black, the black community is overrepresented in the mental health or the mental institutions as it is, you know, in the prisons and other, other forms. Um, and thank, thank you, I think what you said was really good. Professor Chamberlain, if I could join the others in thanking you, commending you first of all for the most insightful and comprehensive presentation. It's, it was very much appreciated, I think, by all of us here. I wanted to pick up on, well, or just reference two points to ask a question. You spoke about the populism behind um, the government's push towards a more restrictive or backward immigration policy in 2010. Um, and you also spoke about, when asked the question about why haven't West Indians in a sense been more organized about what happens when persons suffer systematic marginalization and discrimination over time, how that can penetrate the site here, can affect you. But what I want to ask with, for you as a resident there now is the read on where the politics in the UK is going. It's very easy for us to criticize the government in power, of a conservative government and blaming that a lot of that on them. But Brexit suggested that both parties, or many of the parties, have an equal, equal challenge with the notion of other sense of xenophobia, um, a negative attitude of perception towards foreign. How do you see that playing out now in the United Kingdom? We can't seem to get a fix on the politics of the UK, as I'm sure you can't either. <laughs> but how do you see the crime in the now speaking to me, being able to be more progressive around the issues of race and really put giving meaning to what is supposed to be a multicultural and a modern global. How long have you got, Guy? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I mean, what's happening in Britain now, and I'm speaking here from the heart, there's you know, no research, nothing, is just a nightmare. Nobody knows what's going to happen. I think the, um, you know, the lead up to Brexit 
started in the 1990s. Arguably, it started beforehand. It has a long, long history of nationalism that had been fairly kept under control. But what Brexit did was, of course, to release that. And it released a particularly toxic version of it that is a white nationalism that is also an English nationalism. It's not Scottish, it's not Irish, it's not Welsh. Um, and, you know, the causes of that may well be found in devolution, for instance. You know, Scots got their parliament, Northern Ireland, the Welsh, the English don't have their own parliament, you know, so there was a sense of grievance. I mean, that was all being released. Um, the, I'm going to lose my thread here. Um, the Tory party, the, you know, the party in government at the moment is being very much wagged by its far right tail. And they are, Theresa May in particular, but David Cameron before, is terrified. They don't want to be the leader that goes down in history as splitting the Tory party. So they're trying to keep them on board. As for the Labour Party, Jeremy Corbyn and um, Seamus Milne are both Brexiters. You know, there is a hard left Brexit position. Um, Lexit, it's called, uh, which um, hasn't changed since 1975. And it hasn't accommodated, it hasn't moved with the, with the, you know, with, with the times. And they are controlling Labour Party policy on this, despite the fact that nearly 80% of the membership voted to remain. And there's also, that's become kind of infiltrated in this, a very, very nasty trope of anti-Semitism. So although they all claim that they're not racist, um, you know, some of the anti-Semitic uh, you know, whatever they're called, tweets or, or whatever, I mean, are really absolutely shocking. Now, why that's emerged at this time, you know, who knows, you could probably answer as well as I, you know, anti-Semitism is a light sleeper in times of economic hardship, you know, it wakes up. Um, but what the future will bring, I don't, I just don't know, I think the genie, the really toxic, nasty genie is out of the bottle, and it's going to be really, really hard to push that back in. I don't know, Guy. <laughs> I'd love to moan about it forever. Are there any, any other questions? May I take the liberty as chair and ask my own question? Yeah. Because I've been wondering about this uh, ever since I, I heard about the Windrush scandal, the so-called Windrush scandal. And I don't know if I've ever gotten a very effective answer, just to bring it back to the migrant experience. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm the daughter of migrants to Canada, and I think one of the things that was very difficult for me to absorb was why people had not gotten their status, because that was such an important part of the process of legitimizing yourself in this space. And I'm, I'm wondering if that came out at all in any of your oral history research. When you were speaking to migrants, did you ask about ideas of status, of, of getting that kind of legitimacy and not being questioned, um, and whether that kind of experience extended to their children as well? Thanks, Tara. Well, um, the answer is I didn't ask because it wasn't an issue. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think most West Indians assumed that they were British citizens. So when the 71 legislation in particular came about, um, they didn't, you know, assuming they heard about it, I mean, I don't recall any big public education campaign, but, you know, I might have been blind to that because it didn't affect me. Um, but, you know, people didn't think it was necessary. 
to legitimate their status. They assumed, and rightly, as it has been shown, that they were here perfectly legitimately. Um, you know, and then, I mean, you know, when it was queried, and it was queried not by the Home Office, this is what's really insidious about it, but that kind of policing was um, devolved to frontline agencies like, you know, the, the, the National Health Service, like the schools, employers, landlords, who then had to prove that, you know, whoever they were offering a service to or employment or whatever, uh, was here legitimately. And, I mean, it, it even goes, and I, I get so, well, if I get angry, I mean, what can other people do? You know, if I've had to, which I've done from time to time, viva a PhD, and I'm now required to come with my passport to show that I am legitimate in this country and can claim the measly fee that we get paid for it. But, um, you know, but at the time, I mean, 71 people didn't think it was necessary to register. And, you know, people have been absolutely caught out by this. I mean, you know, Guy Hewitt will be able to tell you much more. Am I right, Guy? <laughs> Oh, okay, we will take one final question. In response to Dr. Innes' question to Professor Chamberlain, I just want to share personal experience. I was an adult in 1981, obviously married, and I can remember credit to the Barbados Embassy in London. At that time, I think the official was Isaac Simmons, and he and his sidekick, Jeff Hunt, hosted many meetings in Reading, at a very prominent place where we all used to frequent, and he literally begged us, and he explained that if we did not register as British, any children brought born would not be British. So, many of us on that evening said things like, Oh, I don't really want to belong to them because they don't treat us very well. But then others of us could see that we were going to be in trouble if we didn't do it. The priest that married me and my husband, we lived in a kind of area in Reading which was a lot of black people. He couldn't drive, I think he had a health condition. He would drive, ride around on his bicycle. And he said, please, please tell your relatives Anybody you know, please tell them to register. And then they actually, they actually arranged, there was a, a magistrate in that district who would sign you up for free. And she would open up to 8 and 9 o'clock and 10 o'clock at night so that we could avail ourselves of press service. So as I was saying, I highlight the embassy at that time for making an effort. But yes, I agree, I don't recall the British government kind of disseminating information. It was very much local. So clearly, if other people's embassies were not as vibrant of ours, those nationals missed help. Thank you. Thank you, Corrine. No, um, it, it's just that Corrine was one of my star informants. <laughs> and I never asked you if you were here legitimately. It never occurred to me. Right. Well, the research continues. I think that we need to be, be need to be doing. Um, I want to thank Professor Chamberlain again. I, I would appreciate another round of applause for her <laughs> contribution this evening. I'm so glad that we had this discussion tonight. I'm so glad that you brought so so many points to bear on our future discussions as well. Um, I want to invite our audience to attend the next uh, session of the series, uh, this lecture series. Um, Coming Home to Mother, Documenting the Migrant Experience by Claude Graham. That will include a screening, actually, of uh, a number of his recorded testimonies with um, Barbadian migrants in the UK. That will take place next 
Thursday, May 16th, not Wednesday. We're taking a little, doing a little change. Next Thursday evening, um, also at six o'clock. And what I would also like to like you to do, but in the future, she's not here tonight. But if you do have any of these stories that you would like to share with the museum and and put on record, I would really encourage you to do that. It is so important that we work with our repositories, our archives, our libraries, our museums to help document these stories. We are an oral culture, and therefore we need to have that kind of recording going forward so that we are able to use this in the future for, for the le lessons that need to be learned from this experience. So thank you so much for your attendance tonight. Um, please come out to the future uh, uh, lectures and, and um, activities in this series. And a very, very warm, uh, round of applause for yourselves for sitting through tonight as well. Thank you so much. I would like to invite you now to um, get some refreshments at the back of the, uh, the open air theater. And then there are other, other uh, there's a bookseller at the end, at the back to Annie T. Thank you very much. <laughs>